Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone to this month's PCA meeting. Um, so today we have um, Ursula Pike here, uh, who served in Bolivia from 1994 to 1996 in the youth in micro enterprise development sector. Much of her work since serving in Peace Corps has had to do with managing projects in higher education with a focus on equity and accessibility. And in 2016, she also gained her Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction. Um, and her first book was published in uh, April of uh, this year, 2021, and is available at a Room of One's Own's bookstore. Mm -hmm. And her presentation will be an interview style with her husband, Ken Peters, who will be serving as the interviewer. He also served in Bolivia from 1995 to 1997 as a community agricultural agriculture volunteer. Um, and he is from Hilbert, Wisconsin and is a graduate of UW Oshkosh. And he is currently a bilingual counselor at an elementary school in Austin. Um, and in 2018, he and Ursula returned to Bolivia and traveled around together, surely visiting their friends and communities from service. So um, yeah, without further ado, Ursula. Great, thank you for that introduction. Um, and it's so nice to be here. I really appreciate this. Our dog is barking right now <laughs> for some reason. Um, so if you hear that in the background, it's real life. Uh, so before we start, I would, uh, I'd really love to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so here in Austin, we are on Comanche land. Um, it's also uh, Jumano, Tonkawa, Lipan Apache, and Kowawitikan land. But there in Madison, you're occupying ancestral Ho-Chunk land. Now in 1832, uh, Ho-Chunk were forced to cede that territory, um, but I would still like to start this event by recognize the, recognizing the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the other 11 First Nations of Wisconsin. All right. Well, <laughs> as Sarah said, um, I am Ursula Pike, and I served in the Peace Corps in Bolivia from 1994 to 1996. Um, my book, An Indian Among Los Indígenas, a Native Travel Memoir, uh, which just came out uh, two weeks ago, is about that experience. Yeah, and I'd like to introduce you to my husband, Ken Peters. Okay, and part of this process, I will be interviewing Ursula. So with that, without further ado, I'll start this interview process. I'll answer, ask her some questions, and then she might ask me back a few of these. So here we go. Why did you apply to Peace Corps? What were you hoping to accomplish? So when I was in high school, I worked in the library. And one of the things that I was assigned to do was go through old magazines. And I remember looking at an old life magazine and seeing pictures of Peace Corps volunteers, and some of the first Peace Corps volunteers. And I, the more I read about it, the more I was excited to possibly join. But quite honestly, none of the volunteers on those pages look like me or seem to have experiences like me. Um, they were primarily white volunteers who were serving in Africa. And I, my mother worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs for years. And I understood that sometimes there are opportunities that are complex, that are complicated, but where you can still learn and do something worthwhile. And, and so, and in high and in college, I was pretty active in student groups and I learned a lot about Latin America. And so when I was um, assigned to Bolivia, I was really excited um, because I knew it was a predominantly indigenous country. Um, and I was excited to go and show like a different version of of what a volunteer might look like to be a native person serving in an indigenous country. Do you have anything to add about your experience? Um, interesting enough, when we were 
doing this before, I did not know realize the life magazines of Ursula. Mine was a little bit similar to that. There was always, I have it stuck in my head, a, a Peace Corps um, TV commercial. This guy, he's riding his horse and he was doing the cattle or doing something, Argentina maybe. And it said, the toughest job you'll ever love. And as uh, growing up with not a whole lot of money and uh, no um, way to travel, I thought this would be a great opportunity to just, I always said, fall off the earth, just go somewhere and live for two years and just do this thing. So that was my big push was like a way to travel, uh, an opportunity to see different cultures. All right. Great. Next one. What was the application or interview process like? Uh, I'll be honest, it was really long and painful. <laughs> and I know they've updated their uh, process somewhat in, in the interim. But, you know, for me, I remember feeling specific, specifically challenged by getting referrals from faculty and um, or other people that I worked with. That was something I was really uncomfortable with. and because I didn't have good relationships with it, really any of the faculty that, that I went to college with. So that was something that, that challenged me. And then once I was finally invited, um, then uh, I, there was another six months. And you know, to be honest, I asked my Peace Corps recruiter, and I talk about this in the book, what was one thing that, that got me in? And, and she was honest that Peace Corps, and this was back in the 90s, was trying to diversify the volunteers, they, they recognized even then that they needed to increase the diversity of the, the people being sent to serve as volunteers. And that was kind of a strange thing for me to begin my Peace Corps experience with, but she was being honest. I appreciate that. So, um, yeah. And, uh, just, uh, picking back on that a little bit, I agree. Uh, that the process is a little bit lengthy and uh, some people I knew who were signing up at the same time somewhere on this web actually that filled out their application and were gone bef and I still hadn't filled out mine and then when I got accepted there was a year waiting process so in that process the person who I was with my significant other at the time I actually paused my Peace Corps in between there and then re up and said, yes, I want to do it. So it was a lengthy process. And then waiting um, made me, you know, second guess what I was doing a little bit. But I'm sure glad that I uh, kept up with the process and, and went through with it. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, what was the, oh, we did that one. Okay. How would you describe? Where are we? I lost it. Sorry. That's okay. Thank How you. Would you describe? Thank you. Thank you. How would you describe Peace Corps staff support for your work and whether the challenge of neocolonialism was addressed during training or afterward? Um, I'm really glad that this was one of the questions that we were recommended to, to address. So for me, the staff was absolutely critical in that in those first three months, and not just the training staff, the Peace Corps staff. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the kitchen with the cook who who helped me in many ways that and answered questions for me that I didn't know the answer to, and it those relationships were critical for me and. Uh, and probably some of the most helpful. And you know, in the book, I talk about um, the challenge of of getting my clothes clean. And I think that this relates to that's why there's water in the title of this presentation. Is that you know there was a lack of access to to clean, affordable water, especially in Cochabamba where we were, and um, and that impacts Indigenous women specifically because who's feeding the kids? Who's making sure the clothes are clean? It's them and the harder access, safe water is to access, the more they have to work. And so I went with the women in where I was staying and washed our clothes at the river. And it was, 
it actually made me really angry because I thought, why did they have to wash their clothes at the river? And it's because the infrastructure that would have supported them having water all the time at their house didn't exist. This was a primarily indigenous community on the edge of Cochabamba, a big city, but they still didn't have access to water. They still to this day don't have regular water all the time. And, and it and really broke my heart. But the second part of this question is about whether the challenge of neocolonialism was addressed. And actually, I think that the, um, the trainers did a good job. They, there's this film called Blood of the Condor, and you can watch it on Vimeo. Um, it's by a Bolivian director, Jorge Sanguinas, and it is a critical, um, it's an amazing film because it's mostly in Quechua, it's mostly in, in, in an indigenous language. And it's a almost parody, but it's a spot on parody of the most arrogant version of a development worker that you could ever see. And, um, and we saw this film and really, and had a big discussion afterwards about what did we think about these volunteers and, and their impact on the community. And um, I appreciated that we were shown that film. Um, it, I was maybe pretty quiet, and I talk about that in the book, that after it, I, I had a lot of thoughts that maybe I didn't share with my, my peers at the time because I was kind of overwhelmed and a little bit traumatized by watching this film. And I think that, um, but I think it was an important film to show us. And I really recommend anybody who can find it and watch it. It's, it's fascinating. It's a 1969 film, but it's still incredibly pertinent, I think. So um, do you have anything you want to add about that? Yeah, I just uh, two things I have in my notes. Uh, one again was the water, the water situation too was uh, last six months of my, of my service, they, or maybe it was a little bit longer, but they're rebuilding the water structure in my community and they started and then stopped. So all of, nobody had water. So that process, the painful process of walking down to the river and getting buckets of water and the river was like a mile in some from my house was just, just really, really, really difficult. So that the importance of water, I agree with Ursula was one of the main things. And then also the blood of the condor, I do agree with you because again, I class myself as a naive Wisconsin boy coming straight off the farm. So, um, when they presented that to me, I just kind of took it with a grain of salt. But when I was in my community and then a representative of my community saying, some saying, oh, this is why you're here, very similar to the movie doing these, doing these things. And I was like, what? Shocked, like what? No, that is not my intention here. But I feel fortunate that they had taught me about that. So I was aware so that when the time came, I was aware of what they were talking about. So I do I agree with both of those points you have there. Okay. Let's um, see, what was, we wanna ask about the arrival on site? Yeah, okay, thank you. Why did I highlight some and not <laughs> all other states? Good job, Mr. Peters. What was the arrival on site like? Thoughts, impressions, smells, sounds? Um, you know, it, it, for the, it was good and bad. So I was replacing a volunteer and, um, and she had done a great job getting a grant to support uh, a charango workshop. Charangos are these little 10, inch, uh, ten string musical instruments that that part of Bolivia is famous for. And, um, and she was kind of terse with me, uh, not super helpful, but she was also going through her own stuff. I later realized, you know, she was about to be, have to leave this community where she'd lived and built relationships for two years. And, and so she was leaving and, and I'm sure there was some mixed feelings about, about me being there. But that, all, that same visit, I was introduced to the um, staff the kitchen staff at the children's home where I served. And I remember walking into that kitchen and those, the, these three women, the, the cook, the cook's helper and a teacher 
they were immediately really warm to me and joking and teasing with me. And it was very familiar. And, and those three women actually ended up helping me throughout the entire time in my service. And those relationships were really critical. Because, you know, when I came to Bolivia, I, I thought, oh, as a Native person, I'm going to have some immediate connection with the indigenous population. And I did not. That was immediately, that made, was made clear to me within minutes of arriving. However, it, what I discovered is that these relationships with Bolivians that I put time and effort into were the ones, were the connections that I was looking for when I went there. So, um, do you have anything you want to say about arriving yeah, on site? Just a couple of things. Um, I feel, I don't know if all Peace Corps does it the same way, but we, we were with host families during our training. So I feel very fortunate that the host family, because again, I feel like I was very naive and struggled with the language and just the overwhelming part of the culture. And just like you had your own room and be able to take me literally by the hand to come for the meal because I didn't understand what language, you know, it was challenging. So really grateful for that family who helped me out. And then the other piece, I wanted to say was yes, same same deal in in my community or where I was being placed. There was three a choice of three communities, and the and the volunteer prior to me was living in this small community, and I, I just I really wanted it to be my own feeling, so I chose a different community that never had a, a gringo living in it, Melga. But that also then came with its challenges because then nothing was set up. There wasn't a room or a housing to take over. And so um, it was a challenge in that aspect, but I did love that I had my own unique first gringo there um, type of experience. So those are the two things that came up with me on that one. Okay. I think the next one is, I, I, and maybe we skipped over this, uh, describing a project, one highlight, uh, one project oh. that didn't work, right? Okay, yes, it says description of at least one highlighted project and one project that wasn't successful. I, I like this question because um, it, I think it gets at the, the heart of what we, uh, why we go there. I, I worry that, I know that I have this, sense that maybe I could save some people or, and the truth is that I really wasn't there to save anybody, that um, I was there to serve and to learn. And um, that was, that was most important. I felt, I put a lot of pressure on myself and I felt like I never was making enough of a difference. But in retrospect, I, I think that um, I, the difference that was being made was in my life. Um, I, I did a bakery project with that teacher from the, the children's home and the girls were able to, we baked some products and or we, we made these little rolls and we sold them at the market. And that was good. But what I liked even better is that the next semester they came back and they stopped making those rolls, but they took that same um, micro enterprise idea and they started making popsicles and selling those. And, and I think that um, that just showed that they were, they didn't need my help to, to do that project. They went ahead and did it themselves and, and they used it to meet their needs. Um, I also, you know, was supposed to be selling these charangos that we were making at the workshop and I am a terrible salesperson. <laughs> So I was never able to sell them. I bought a couple, I sold one or two to some visiting um, Westerners, but really I did not do a great job of selling. And uh, so it was, it was a good experience, but definitely I was not good at everything. So let's see, um, yeah. how are we doing for time? We got five. Are we? Oh, we got time? We got, we have five minutes. Okay, I'm just gonna add two on my project high where again, a, a different person was there uh, and they were my, the thing that they wanted me to do was an Angora rabbit program. And, uh, but within like three months of being there, I think the agency that was supposed to do it closed down. So 
And they said, well, we can move you somewhere else or, or what would you like to do? So then coming up with something else on my own uh, was what I ended up doing. I wrote a small grant uh, for Carpa Solari's um, uh, I'm, I'm melting. Um, greenhouse. Greenhouses. Greenhouses. Uh, yeah, greenhouses. So I did a greenhouse project. Again, that was what the, the my neighbors and community farmers really wanted. So, and then they took that and ran with it. Again, like, oh, what is your, how do you say, what is your term where you say, I'm not coming there to save people. It's not empty vessels. Oh, oh. yeah. They're not empty vessels that we're coming there to fill with our generosity that they, they know. But I taught, I was taught more things about agriculture because again, the type of agriculture I grew up in farming in Wisconsin is completely different than farming in Bolivia. Um, so learned a lot, but I did eventually come around to help and do a uh, score a project that was working for them. So, yeah. Right. Okay. I think in the interest of time, let's go to the last two questions, which are Rhonda, the, yeah. <laughs> um, here? Yeah. Okay. Where, where were there challenges being a Native American working in an Indigenous community? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, I mean, that's what the whole book is about. And um, I think one of, I, I think there were challenges, but also being an American Indian gave me a perspective that I really wish I'd been able to share more with the other volunteers because as a native person, I had experienced people coming to my community and saying, I'm here to help. And that help sometimes really was dehumanizing and, and didn't respect us or, or didn't even look at what we needed or what we wanted. It was, they decided ahead of time what we needed and, and that's the project that they decided to, to fund or do. And so that, that made me um, to understand that that help is a loaded word when you're coming from another more privileged culture um, or, or situation and, and coming to serve that it really needs to involve incredible humanity and, um, and humility. And I also had been, I, I studied Latin American studies in college and I, I knew the history of colonialism, of Western colonialism in South America. And so I understood that everything we did was happening within that shadow of colonialism, that there were hundreds of years of Westerners coming that, you know, when that, when that person said, when the Bolivian said that to, to Ken, of course they said that to Ken. Of course they, there was a, a suspicion of, of outsiders because I think um, they are coming from a history that 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 was the reality. So that's. that's I got all. I got nothing on that question. Right there. <laughs> Not a Native American. Okay, uh, last one. After returning from Bolivia, how has the Peace Corps impacted your life? Well. Besides marrying a volunteer, <laughs> and um, I, uh, I've had a lot of friends and family, but you know, for me, one of the biggest advantages has been I went to graduate school. About a year after Peace Corps, I became a Peace Corps fellow at Western Illinois University. I don't know that I ever would have gone to graduate school if it weren't for that opportunity. There, um, it. I was an AmeriCorps volunteer and it paid for my tuition. I worked in a rural community in Southern Illinois and did community development, learned so much about how projects work. Um, also, there are job interviews that I have been on because there was a Peace Corps on my resume. And um, I know that because that's what they asked me about. And sometimes I got the job, sometimes I didn't, but I know that that's what got me in the door. And, you know, I know that the Biden administration is talking about wanting to diversify the foreign service. And I just think the Peace Corps is such a great um, pathway to that career and it can help diversify the foreign service, the, the increasing the diversity of Peace Corps volunteers can increase the diversity of the foreign service. So, and then of course I wrote this book. So that's how it's also impacted my life. So 
Me too. The trajectory of my life has just, it's been based off of Peace Corps because of, of the Spanish piece. I was able to get in grad school and do a program called Teacher Corps in Mississippi where I got a master's in curriculum instruction and a teaching license. And then I taught Spanish for 20 years and then moved into other things, but it's always been based on the education um, education field and which started from the Peace Corps knowing Spanish. And even the job I currently have, it was a bilingual uh, counselor, which I never thought about. I was like, yeah, sure, I can, I can do that. And that's all based off of the Peace Corps experience. And then the other piece that Ursula and I have discussed when we we're doing this was that how there are friends or people that I associated, associated with in Peace Corps that I would in, never associated with, never would be associated with in the United States. Just how this political um, existence we're living in right now, if we didn't, if they did a mandatory Peace Corps, I think it would maybe get rid of some of this uh, polarization we're having right now, but. Anyways. Right, right. National service can can help reduce partisanship because it puts people you, it, working towards a common goal from a variety of backgrounds. So that that's why mm -hmm. I'm a proponent of it. So, so that's the, all our questions um, that we wanted to answer. Uh, Kate and Sarah, um, should I go ahead and, and start the reading or what? Yeah, I'll jump in for just a second here and encourage people to put your questions into the chat screen um, uh, because there will be uh, at least 15, 20 minutes at, afterwards after the reading to uh, have that discussion and even longer for those who have can stay longer than five o'clock. But uh, do, do feel free to get your questions in there and we'll try to get to them all. And, and if you want to, I, I see people some are students, some of these names, some are um, uh, UW faculty or staff, some are former, I see uh, emeritus in here. I see people from the RPCVs of Madison as well. You're all over the place. So if you wanna just throw in who you are and whether you served in Peace Corps or not, feel free. Yes, please do. Please let us know who you are, uh, where you are, That'd be great. Well, in the meantime, I'll go ahead and start the, the reading. It's, it's not a, a super long reading. So it's from uh, chapter seven, and which is called uh, La Chaya, which is a, like a christening. So Chaya. Chaya, okay. Rinaldo, my regional supervisor, came by for a surprise visit. He was charming and warm with a salt and pepper beard and a neatly pressed shirt that made him the picture perfect example of a Bolivian engineer. He invited me to attend the christening of several water projects. Two water wells and water catchment ponds were finally ready for use after years of work. The opportunity to go out to the countryside for the day was a welcome relief from trying to figure out how to make myself useful a daily goal I rarely accomplished. I squeezed in between a volunteer named Greg and an official from the La Paz office. The sky was cloudless, the air was dry, and I knew the day would be warm. In the front passenger seat sat Daniel. We hadn't spoken beyond the moment at my birthday party. I saw him walking through Cantuta in the early evening, dust flying off his jeans and imagined that he spent his days in the fields with the farmers discussing techniques for improving yield. Daniel was another volunteer in my town. I was envious of the experience he was having or that I imagined he was having. Rinaldo drove slowly over the cobblestones leading to the main street. It was a strange privilege to be riding in a private vehicle, something I hadn't done in over a month. Even sitting shoulder to shoulder in a row of seats was a luxury that gave me the opportunity to watch the people. Women and children walked along the sidewalks toward the market carrying empty shopping bags. The heavy doors of the post office were shut as usual and I hoped there would be letters from home coming soon. A skinny dog sniffed a discarded plastic bag. 
The fat man who sold coca sat in the doorway of his store behind three foot high plastic bags of the green leaves. Daniel waved as we passed and the coca seller tipped his head in our direction. We crossed the dry riverbed and the car sped up as the road widened. The valley opened up to the right of the road where green fields were spotted with occasional small red and brown houses. A man leading a trio of donkeys tied together stepped off the road as we approached. We came around a bend and the green hills covered with short leafy shrubs came into view. Dirt paths led up and over the hills. The children from the center followed those paths back to their families in the countryside on weekends. Greg, the other volunteer, tightened his smile as the vehicle bounced over the uneven road. He'd been sick for two weeks and I was surprised he was there. Diarrhea took out more volunteers temporarily or permanently than homesickness or poorly matched volunteer assignments. I had suffered too, but my body adjusted. I understand the, understood the pain though. Being sick in this unfamiliar country was demoralizing. Lying on a lumpy mattress, drinking warm bottled water and taking 10 trips a day to the latrine intensified the discomfort. I wondered whether Greg was thinking about leaving. Did Peace Corps pay for these wells? I asked Ronaldo, speaking loudly to make sure he heard me over the engine. The farmers are the ones who built these wells and the reservoirs, Daniel answered, not turning his head. The grant, the pump, that was easy compared to the amount of work the community put in. Each family benefited from these projects, had to commit to over a month of labor to help complete the project. How much work did that take? How many meetings and trips out to their farm to convince them this was worth it? All of it in Spanish, then translated into Quechua, then back into Spanish. This was the first Peace Corps project I had heard of that sounded like real development. After 20 minutes, Daniel instructed Ronaldo to turn off onto a smaller road that led into the fields. Greg groaned as we slammed into a deep pothole. Poor Greg. Cholitas in short skirts walked next to men wearing button-up shirts. The farther we went, the more people were walking. My heart sped up. We're here, Daniel yelled as the road ended. Ronaldo parked in front of a small mud and straw home and with a red tile roof. Daniel was already out of the car. Rows of undulating dirt fields spread out in front of me. Small clusters of trees dotted the landscape between the fields and small adobe homes. The wind blew slightly, stirring up the dust. I was glad I wore brown shoes that day. 25 farmers, Cholitas, and a few small children walked toward the open field beyond the building. The sky was cloudless and my head was already starting to heat up. The women next to me spoke to each other in Quechua. The men tucked stiff coca leaves into their cheeks and passed around the small green bag of leaves so everyone had enough. The wind blew off the field into the crowd. I stood on my tiptoes trying to see whether the event was beginning. Dirt was under my feet, in my face, and spreading out before me. I fantasized about escaping to a cool room to sit down with a glass full of ice cubes made from purified water. Buenos dias, a man wearing a hat said. His hat was miraculously not dusty. He said this into a squeaky bullhorn before beginning his speech in Quechua. Another man holding the bullhorn called the event a chaya, a christening. I repeated the word under my breath. One last speaker blessed the well by lighting incense, pouring chicha onto the ground and throwing confetti over the hole. They were offering, these were offerings for Pachamama even though no one said that word. Pachamama was sort of like Mother Earth, but she needed to be fed. Anytime the earth was disturbed, the Bolivians provided an offering. It reminded me of the sage twigs that are burned at the beginning of powwows or in a new house. No one ever explained exactly what the burning sage was meant to achieve, but I knew it was less about celebrating an accomplishment and more about moving forward with humility. Don Daniel began one man at the bullhorn. Mr. Daniel, he thanked Daniel for his work. I didn't understand every word, but the respect he had for Daniel was obvious. I wanted that. Switches were flipped, cranks were turned, and everyone turned to look at the spigot on the other side of the field. Nothing happened. A man pulled off his jacket and knelt down by the motor. There was banging and someone yelled, ready. 
A motor started and the water gushed out in huge streams. Everyone clapped. The dirt rose darkened with water and women standing next to me stepped aside to let the water flow past. I sniffed and then, to my complete surprise, I started crying. This was just a dumb little water pump project. Why was I so emotional? On this day, because of months of work by Daniel and hours of labor by the members of the community, there was a well pumping water in a dry, hot field. The impact of that piece of machinery for these people whom I had spent the morning standing next to wasn't small. The water would help the farmers produce and sell more crops. It might be part of the reason they'd stay in the community instead of traveling south to grow coca plants. My knowledge about how economies and politics worked had hardened me to the meaning of one single act like this. It was difficult not to be cynical. I knew that a small community of farmers producing a few more bushels would not lift the people of Bolivia out of poverty that five centuries of colonialism and neocolonialism had put in place. But that day, that moment standing in the field helped me see that one small thing could have value. Economic development had never been so tangible to me. It was under my fingernails and staining my socks. Every single one of those farmers and their children would live a tough, sparse life, but the water was flowing. It was clear that neither Daniel nor the Peace Corps was the savior here, that they had helped make this project a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was, um, Really, the, the, the whole thing is very powerful. Thank you for your presentation. So there, there are no questions in the chat, but let's open up the, the um, for verbal, just feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. I, th I think I'll just um, put us all up here in a different format so that we can see each other a little bit better. There we go. Can see some of us. One thing, the oh, oh are ahead. you start all? over? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention one thing. When we went back to visit a couple of years back, the same cocoa seller was there. The same gentleman. That was that was pretty neat. So we have a question from Patrick Conway. He, he wanted to know if you could comment on what languages you learned in service. I understand there are multiple indigenous languages in Bolivia. Yes, yes. So um, we learned both Spanish and then Quechua. But you're right, there's over a hundred tribes in Bolivia. Um, so the two largest are the Aymara, which are who are primarily um, around La Paz, and, and then the Quechua, who are in the region where I am. So you learned Quechua also? Quechua ta parla nichu. No, no, I don't speak Quechua. I just, I say that still. How many years later? <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. I mean, it's good to be able to, even if all you can say is my name is, or a greeting, you know, and they would always tease us uh, when they would have longer conversations and we wouldn't understand them. But I know as someone who speaks you know, some of my language, it's important to, to show that you're making the effort. Um, yeah, I have a question. Is there anything um, looking back on your guys' service that you wish you would have done um, that you didn't have time to do? For me, um, it's more about, I, I wish that I had had understood that I was there to to learn and to serve, not that I was trying to save anybody, that, that this was an experience that um, I, was, I was receiving a lot and, and worry less about, oh, I have to do this or that. Uh, I, I wish I had, that's the one thing I, I wish I had, had done. Yeah, and I always think of the, is this in Peace Corps? Do I make these things up myself? But the 33% rule, like 33% of the job that you're going to do is learning their culture. 33% is them learning about you. And then 
3% is actually your project. So if my project, I felt like I struggled, 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 and finally had a project and then I was leaving that the time was a, a thing. So I wish maybe in that aspect, I could have figured out what I was doing a little bit quicker. Um, and then hindsight too is like, I spent all these years in education. I really wish that there was a big school and I could have helped maybe at the school somehow, but yeah. Thank you. Curious about um, a comment that I saw in the chat screen. It wasn't a question, but um, Sue Peters is apparently Ken's sister. And she mentioned that she also served in Bolivia at, at the same time, kind of overlapping with both of you or so. How did, how did that happen, that a brother and sister got placed in Bolivia? Yeah, supposedly that's just, um, what they told us was that it was the only brother-sister uh, Peace Corps thing that ever happened. I was supposed to go to Ecuador, but three months before that, back in 95, there was some sort of incident with Ecuador and Peru. Peru. So they pulled all the volunteers from Ecuador. So they said, don't worry, we still have a place for you. We'll tell you in the next couple of weeks. So three months before I was leaving to go somewhere, I had no idea where I was going. And they said, you're going to Bolivia. And I didn't, because I had that conflict where I had already said that I, I didn't know if I wanted to do Peace Corps because of this relationship I was in. I didn't want to tell them that my sister was in Bolivia. Somehow it didn't connect with them until I showed up in Bolivia. And then they're like, wait, what? You guys are here together? This cannot happen. They were not happy. We're not happy, but it worked out. She was like in, that's what I convinced. Sue was in near La Paz. I was in Cochabamba. It's like a 10 or 12 hour bus ride. If we don't want to see each other, we don't, we don't necessarily have to see each other. So that's kind of in a nutshell what happened. And they were in the same group. So Ursula knew my sister. Uh, right, you don't, you don't wanna be at, our, at, at the in-laws house at Christmas after we've had a couple of beers and we just never stop with the Peace Corps stories. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the 80s in Senegal, but I've also had a chance to go to Cochabamba through Mano a Mano, and I'm wondering if you're oh, familiar with um, yes, some Mama. of their work. And I, I worked um, not in the not in the uh, agricultural sector, but in education and giving workshops to teachers there. But yes. I just. You know, they work really on that Peace Corps model of the community needs to have some skin in the game. And it's just really inspiring what I'm able to see there with their projects. That's great. Yes, I, I know about uh, Mano Mano because um, actually another volunteer who's also native, um, he served a few years after me. His wife is a Bolivian and she, her name is Carmen and she works for Mano Mano. And I have really mm -hmm. been impressed with, with their approach to, to development and, um, and their projects and, um, and how they deliver um, prosthetic devices and crutches and wheelchairs. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Mano a Mano. So I'm glad you brought them up and, and I'm glad that you were able to work with them. Oh yeah, you know, and one of the founders and she was a volunteer in Bolivia. So, you know, they very much in the, you know, we're working for the community. We're not here to tell you what to do. Yeah. Um, and they've just done some amazing things with these reservoirs and just taking this land that had been so degraded and trying to, to work with us. I, I know, I know Carmen, I'm just kind of blocking on which woman she is. Um, yeah. Is she in is she in St. Paul then? She's working yeah. in St. Paul, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. That's that's how I know her. Not from Bolivia, but from working in St. Paul. I live in Minnesota. Oh, I'm yeah. not even sure I got the invitation to this, but <laughs> jumped in. I know you guys would let me.
I have a question I'm going to put in the chat screen here. Um, it's not actually from me, but it's from my son who's watching over on the side. Um, and uh, he said, he actually read the book that uh, before I did, he sped through it really fast because um, he's an English teacher and that's what he does. <laughs> um, but you ask an incredible question in your writing. How, did, how indigenous people must sometimes choose between culture and their survival? In your writing, you don't seem to have an answer. Do you feel you are any closer to answering this question? No. Oh, that's a great question. A really tough question. Uh, you know, I, I think that if the if people can recognize that that it feels like we have to make that choice, um, that indigenous people have to choose development or keeping connected to their culture, then um, I think that if we can focus on trying to uh, or recognizing that and respecting that, then there, that's where the answer comes. I, I, maybe I'm not being, I'm probably not being clear, but so for example, I work with community colleges. I work in higher ed and we're asking ourselves these questions in higher ed as well. How do we, uh, one way that we can increase academic outcomes across the board so that everybody is succeeding in higher ed at the same rates um, is to respect everybody's cultural identity, to, to recognize that one size is not going to fit everybody and that different um, interventions are required to support other people. And, and, um, and I, I don't have, you know, one single answer, but I think it's just like with any of the equity work that, that we do, that there's no one single solution. It, it's everybody coming up with being open to do things differently um, to achieve different results. And, um, and I think that like this mano a mano project is, is one way that they're not, um, they, they seem to not tell people, this is how you need to change to have a better economy or uh, it's, it's more asking what do people need, but I, I hope more people think about it. I mean, one of the points of the books is, is of the book is to get people to think about this, this dilemma that that we sometimes face and think of solutions. So. That uh, Peace Corps is able to um, uh, approach that in a, in a similar mano a mano fashion. I mean, a, a lot depends on individuals, I'm sure, and, and their ability to, to relay that concept effectively, but any thoughts on that? Oh, how Peace Corps can, can do it better? Well, I'm, I, well, I just know from what we do in what we're doing in higher ed is one, you know, focusing on not just increasing access for participants, but also looking at, for example, faculty, increasing diversification, empowering faculty, black, indigenous, or other faculty of color. Um, so having them part of the decision making. And, and I, I don't know the, the demographic breakdown of Peace Corps administration, but um, I know that, that that's one thing that I have seen work in, in higher ed. Um, and, but as far as in the field, um, I don't know, just to me emphasizing this learn and serve uh, approach and, um, under, I mean, I, I don't know that it was emphasized or I, I don't know if um, how much it was when I served, but, um, and, and maybe it is more now, but just to, to recognize that we're not reminding the volunteers that they're not there to save anybody. Um, and I, I think that I would have felt a lot less pressure if I didn't, if I had felt that, so. And, and to those people who think they are there to save someone, you know, to, to have those hard conversations um, around that. When I was serving in Peace Corps Ghana, that we had a, 
uh, the Peace Corps often makes opportunities available to the volunteers to participate in committees and do work that kind of forces them or, or encourages them to get together and, and, and work together on a project. So I joined a peer support and diversity group and it was really an opportunity for, um, for us to talk about diversity, inclusion, equity. And it, I, we, we arranged some, a couple of movies with discussions afterwards and, and a couple of uh, opportunities for, for workshops. It was, um, it, was, it was helpful. I think it was really helpful. We have to keep talking together. Right. Right. And I think that that's something that at least the students that I encounter at my community college are, they're asking those questions of our institutions. And, um, and I, I know that that's something that they want to, they want to see how, how institutions are promoting equity and not promoting institutionalized racism. So it's, it's a time to talk about it. Um, are there any more, any more questions? You want to say something? <laughs> I didn't catch all of that. I'm sorry, I didn't hear all of that, Kate. Um, Patrick Conway, it looks like you were starting to say something or wanting to say something. Your, your talk your talk box lit up around you that's how I know <laughs> maybe maybe it was a mistake well I think we should should perhaps just uh, oh okay got it got it Patrick it's your airpods no problem um with no other questions, um, I, I just want to mention as a reminder to any of the undergrad students out there or anybody who's considering Peace Corps and wants some advice that my, my office closes on May 14th and I'll be gone all summer. I'm an academic year position only. So if you want to talk to me before then, please uh, contact my office, peacecorps.wisc.edu and you can get to, the, to my email address. Um, I'll be following up with everybody uh, and, and that invitation to, to, to join me for virtual advising or to ask any questions will be in that email as well. Sarah, any announcements for the um, Peace Corps advocates out there? Um, I think we might have um, like a, a um, Earth Day thing that we were planning tomorrow. Um, and we might send out an email about that. Um, but otherwise, I think that we're still deciding whether or not to have one more meeting um, this, this spring and um, kind of the time period. I think that that would be taking place after finals. So if you'd be interested in attending, you wouldn't have to worry about whether it's clashing with your finals or not. And of course, if any non-undergraduate um, persons want to attend um, any future meetings, you're always welcome to come. Um, and yeah, that, I think that's for the most part, everything. Just one more question. Uh, for either uh, Ken or Ursula, any chance you served with Jeffrey Lovelace? He worked in the Peace Corps office in Paraguay, but served in Bolivia. Oh, oh my God, yes. Yeah, yeah, we know Jeff Lovelace. I, well, he knows him. I, I yeah. recognize the name. So, so he was like uh, after my group, I think the next prior group. So there was a year where we were rotating together. He worked outside of La Poste. So, uh, yeah, and I think he married a Bolivian. I do believe, and they have a family in on the East Coast somewhere right now, currently. So. Hmm. If you're well, in touch with him at all, you should let him know about um, a group called the Peace Corps Kids. And it was wow. formed by a young woman who was um, a, a, the product of a Peace Corps volunteer marrying a host country national 
And so they had a mixed race, mixed um, cultural uh, identity kind of uh, ch child and, and her lifestyle. And so she, she wrote, she's formed a group of other Peace Corps kids that have some interesting and similar challenges about adapting sometimes into one country versus the other or moving back and forth between them. But Peace Corps kids, just look that up on the Google that. Yeah, I'll send it to them, definitely. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to just say thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about my book and and read from the book. I always love doing that. And um, thank you, Kate, for reaching out to me. And thank you, Sarah, for introducing us. And thank you, everybody, for attending. It, it was a, a really nice experience for, for me. Thank you so much for coming. I know that everyone really, really likes to hear um, from our PCVs. And it's just a really, really great, great way to kind of um, learn more about the experience from someone who went there firsthand. Um, and it's just really invaluable. I think it's just the best way to kind of learn more and to gauge whether or not it's the right experience. Um, so thank you a lot. We really, really appreciate you coming and, and sharing your experience and helping um, those who attended to, to either connect, because I know there were some RPCVs, but also for undergrads just to get a better understanding and also learn about your book. Um, and hopefully we'll all go out and grab one. So <laughs> it sounds really amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I hope so. Yeah, well, thank you.